Well, hello, hello, all my amazingly beautiful Zodiac family and friends. My name is Anna Bates, and I'm your Zodiac Astrologer. And today, I am here with my Zodiac Astrologer friends, and today we are going to be watching the Mysterious SCPs Horror Stories Animated by IMR Entertainment. Without further ado, let's get started, shall we? Richard. He is the calmest patient of this asylum. He does nothing except stare out of a window. It's been two years now, and he hasn't spoken. No one knows what happened to him. He was shifted here directly from the hospital. The doctors at the hospital said Richard was found unconscious on the side of the road. He was heavily wounded and was bleeding terribly from a serious head injury. A generous man took him in his car and brought him to the nearby hospital. The doctors at the hospital managed to save his life, but Richard didn't say a single word. They found out his whereabouts from the cops. One thing is sure, that none of them knows how a renowned scientist ended up in a mental asylum. What happened to him? Three years back, Richard was a completely healthy and happy man. After finishing his college degrees, he took a job as a junior your researcher in Canada. He worked there for two years and did quite good for himself. He received acclamation for his notable contribution to medical science and bought himself a house in North Carolina. Richard stayed here during his graduation days. He joined as a lecturer in his very own university in North Carolina. Life settled for him. Every day, he woke up, made himself breakfast, and then drove to the university. It's a 15 to 20 minute drive to the university from Richard's house. His class continued till 5 p.m. at the university, and after that, Richard worked on his research papers at the university lab. The work pressure was so much that Richard never had the time to feel lonely. One night, Richard was driving home after work. He was feeling exhausted and tired. All he wanted was to reach home and lie down on the bed. The road was empty, Huge trees stood at the side of the roads. The shadow of the trees combined with the dim street light made the night darker. The bright headlights of Richard's car showed in the way. Richard looked at his watch. It was 10.30. He was used to driving home late at night. Richard rolled down his car windows and cool air touched his face, giving him some refreshment. He was thinking to turn on the speaker just when his eyes went to the left side of the road. Why is she walking alone in the middle of nowhere at this hour of the night? Richard thought to himself. He slowed down the car and went close to her. Hello, miss. Is everything all right? The girl didn't reply. She didn't even turn back once. She just kept walking, like before. Um, miss? Do you need a ride? How far will you go? Well, my house is ten minutes from here. Where are you going? To my house. It's near the lake at the end of the road. I will take the left turn ahead. Richard realized that this girl was going in the opposite direction of his house, but out of concern for a girl walking alone late at night, he said, Um, I don't mind dropping you off, miss, if you're okay with that. The girl turned around. Her eyes were wide and bright. She had a beautiful face, but her skin looked so pale. There was a painful expression on her face, as if she forgot to smile forever. She didn't sit beside Richard. She walked to the other side of the car and sat in the back seat. Richard felt a bit insulted by her behavior, but then he thought that she might be feeling scared. Richard started his car without wasting any time. He will drop her and then head home. The girl was sitting quietly. She's just too quiet, Richard realized. The girl took off her red jacket Richard rolled up the window and turned on the car AC for comfort. It gets extremely hot in summer in North Carolina. Take the left turn, the girl said in the same soft voice. Richard took the turn and kept driving ahead. He knew she would let him know once they reached near her house. After driving for five minutes in pin drop silence, Richard decided to speak up. So you live with your family, miss? He asked. Just me and my mom. I see. So, what do you do? Are you a student? I was, the girl replied. 
It was becoming tough to make conversation with this girl because she showed no enthusiasm in talking to Richard. Hence, the awkward silence once again took place in the car. But the silence didn't stay long this time. Richard was driving on the empty road with no one around. Suddenly, they came in front of an old cemetery and the girl's behavior changed drastically. She started to scratch the car window with her nails while screaming violently. It was as if she was dying to get out of the car. What's wrong? Why are you screaming like that? Open! Let me out! Let me out! What the hell? Richard unlocked the car door. The girl almost bolted out of the car and ran inside the graveyard. Richard's heart was beating like a drum. He had no idea what just happened. Richard came out of the car. Miss? Miss, where are you? He called out for that girl, but she was nowhere to be seen. It felt as if she disappeared into the darkness of the night. Hopelessly, Richard got into his car again and returned home. He was about to get out of the car when he noticed a red jacket lying on the back seat. This must be the girl's jacket. Richard decided to visit her house the next morning and return her jacket. He needs to check out on her. Richard took a shower and finished his dinner. The entire night, he couldn't help but think about that girl. Don't know why, but she seemed so familiar to Richard. While thinking all of this, Richard fell asleep. When he woke up, sunlight was flooding into his bedroom. He got ready, and he decided to drop by the girl's house after work today. Richard took the red jacket and started the car engine. The same road that was appearing spooky at night is now standing like an artist's landscape. Richard finished his work after class and left for the girl's house. When Richard saw the lake at the end, he realized the girl's house is not far. The moonlight made the lake water glitter in the dark. After two to three minutes, he saw a small wooden house on his left. The house looked quite old. With hesitation, Richard rang the doorbell. A few minutes went by, but no response came. He again rang the doorbell. This time, he heard slow footsteps approaching the door. A feeble old woman opened the main door. She seemed old, but her face looked older from sorrow and pain, just like the face of that girl from last night. Um, ma'am, my name is Richard. I gave your daughter a lift last night while she was coming home. I would have dropped her home, but she got off near the cemetery without saying why. She even forgot her jacket in my car. I hope she got home safely last night. I just came to give her jacket. If you can... Ma'am? What's wrong? Is your daughter alright? This can't be my daughter's jacket. There's no way that she could ask for a lift. Why not? It's been seven years since my daughter was found dead in that cemetery. Some monster gouged her eyes and cut out her heart. She died a horrible death. My poor Lydia. The woman broke down into tears holding the main door. Richard noticed a big photograph hanging on the wall nearby. The same girl from last night was in the photograph, except she was standing in front of the science lab of North Carolina University. Oh my god, it was her. Richard stumbled back to his car. He remembered her. The car took up speed as Richard pressed the accelerator hard. Richard remembered this girl. It all happened during his college days. One night, Richard was wandering around, being all high in the graveyard. He took a challenge proving that there was no such thing as ghosts. He thought he was the only one around in the cemetery, but suddenly he heard a girl screaming at the top of her lungs. He followed the screams and found three people torturing a girl. Richard hid behind a bush and watched those men conduct a satanic ritual at that hour. At the end of the ritual, Richard saw those men sacrificing the girl and attempting to take her life. Richard was extremely scared. He ran away that night. When the cops discovered the girl's body, Richard kept his mouth sealed, even after seeing those men who murdered her. Richard kept quiet to save himself from trouble. He behaved like a coward, and maybe this is why Lydia came to take her final revenge that night. After meeting Lydia's mother, 
Richard was rushing home. He was out of his mind. He couldn't believe he gave a lift to a dead girl last night. A sense of guilt mixed with fear numbed Richard's mind. He was almost near the turn when the same girl from last night came running towards his car from the bushes. Her eyes were hollow. There were no eyeballs in them. There was a big hole in her chest where her heart should have been. You could have saved me. You could have saved me. Richard screamed with seeing this vicious figure ah! and drove his car into a nearby tree. He hit his head, but somehow dragged himself out of that car and started to run on the road. He didn't look back. He was scared as he thought the girl might be following him. Still, he fainted on the road that night after running for some time. It's been three years since. Richard hasn't spoken a single word, but today, Richard heard two investigators talking to a man. They were standing near his room. The man was saying, The Foundation has named her SCP-1337, the Vanishing Hitchhiker. We're still researching about her. There's a lot more we don't know yet. But the tough part is, to find out how did she end up being like this. Should Richard tell them how? Or is it too late already? Before starting the story, I would suggest you guys to go subscribe to the channel. It turns out that most of you guys who watch me aren't actually subscribed. So, if you like the content and want to support the channel, go ahead and subscribe and hit the bell. It's free, and you can always change your mind later. Yes, sir. I'll be there, sir. Yes, first thing in the morning. Chris disconnected the call and took a deep breath. What happened now? Martha asked. Chris finished the last layer of coffee and said in a serious voice, A new case has come up. I gotta go investigate the matter. General's telling me that it's urgent. So, when are you leaving? Martha asked. Martha and Chris have been married for four years now. She is well aware of the word urgent when it comes from the general. Chris works with the SCP Foundation that operates dangerous creatures and contains them to save mankind. Martha knows it all and that's why she never asks more than she should. She is well aware of these highly secretive projects. Chris smiled and said, I'm glad I found you. No one would have understood me better than you. The next morning, Chris took the first flight. As soon as he reached the airport, he saw an official waiting for him near the exit gate. He knows the guy. His name is Charles. In the SCP Foundation, everyone is familiar with each other. Welcome, sir. How was your flight? It was good. Tell me, Charles, how many students died in the last four days? Two, sir. But we haven't managed to find their bodies because none of our people managed to reach the end of it. I see. Did you seal the door? Absolutely, sir. Everyone in the university is already terrified. Hmm. You should be. Chris got inside the car. Charles sat right next to him and gestured to the driver to begin. Long, winding mountain roads made the journey quite pleasant but Chris was too worried to enjoy the view. Did you interview the campus staff? No, sir. We were waiting for you only. Okay. Once we reach, this will be our first job. Yes, sir. No. There hasn't been any strike of a serial killer or abduction of any sort. The university of this area is going through a weird but intimidating danger. There have been incidents of people disappearing in the university building. So far, two students have disappeared, and surprisingly, both of them were last seen taking the abandoned basement stairs at the old building. Chris has come to investigate this mysterious staircase that people take and never return. This is so far the most unique phenomenon observed by the SCP Foundation. Students or any working person of the university are terrified to go to the old building, which is also the main building of the campus. At around 11 a.m., they reached near the university gate. The campus was strictly maintained by SCP personnel. As soon as Chris got down from the car, a crew member came rushing towards them. Sir, the university janitor, Mr. Brown, has gone missing since morning. The librarian is saying she saw him early morning. He said he was going to work the old building. Charles, you told me you sealed the door. I yes, sir. We did. We... Then how did another person go missing? Your carelessness has now taken one more life. Idiots! Chris ran towards the old building. 
The two crew members, along with Charles, followed him immediately. As they reached the door, they saw the seal was broken and the door unlocked. Another crew member locked the door immediately, and within an hour, the entire building was sealed. Chris gathered everyone in the campus ground and said, Everyone listen carefully. The old building is now out of reach for any general personnel except SCP Foundation. No one, I repeat, no one should go near that building without my permission. From tomorrow onwards, no one should be seen in this campus. All of your classes and sessions will be conducted in the new building. Your principal, Miss Rose, will share all the class details. Your life could be in danger if you do not listen and obey my instructions. It is extremely terrifying to imagine how two young students and a perfectly healthy man, Mr. Brown, disappeared near the basement staircase of the old building. I would like to conduct interviews with all the people who can offer useful information. Please step forward and help us find out what exactly happened with three people. The students started to walk towards the new building. Charles, take me to the principal's office, Chris said. Miss Rose was sitting in her office with a frightened face. May I come in? Yes, please have a seat, Mr. Smith. You can call me Chris. Okay, Chris. You have to help me. The trustees are going mad over the student's mysterious disappearance. And now the janitor. I'm out of my mind. What the hell is going on here? If you want us to help you, you're going to have to calm down and tell me everything you know about this staircase. Miss Rose drank water from the glass and took a deep breath and said, What do you want to know? How long has this old building been in use? Chris asked. The old building was closed for the last ten years. We were using the new building only, but due to the increased number of students, the trustees decided to renovate the old building and shift some classes there. It's been three months since we started using that building. Everything was going fine. I don't know how this all started. Miss Rose's face was filled with tension and worry. Who uses the basement area? Chris said. Miss Rose took a pause to think, and then said, Actually, no one uses the basement. In fact, no one exactly knows how the basement looks. None of us have been there since it was renovated. The door was locked for a long time. Even during the renovation, it was out of use as well. One day the elevator was out of order, so the electrician came to check it, but... The guy thought the elevator setup was located in the basement, so he broke the lock on the door. But before he could enter, he'd been informed that the elevator room was at the top of the building. So he never went there, but the door was unlocked. I see, Chris replied. He looked at Charles and said, Let's go talk to the others. Miss Rose, I will try my best, but until we discover what lurks down there, please tell people to stay out of that place. I will contact you with more information later. Chris got up and left the room. There were six to seven workers standing at the corridor. The crew members were talking to them. Chris was thinking to start the interview, when suddenly his eyes went to the end of the corridor. The elevator was at the end of the corridor, and a huge yellow plate was hung on it, reading out of order. Charles, was the elevator out of order those days as well? Which day, sir? The day the two students went missing. Yes, I believe you're right. The elevator was out of order on both days, and today it's out of order again. Chris overheard two workers saying, I'm sure they heard the child crying. That's why they followed. Hey, you, come here. A lean average height boy dressed as the cleaning guy came to Chris with a scared face. What were you saying about the child crying? Chris asked. The boy said a dead child haunts the basement staircase. Whenever the elevator is out of order, the child starts crying. People eventually take the staircase when the lift isn't working, but very few people know that the basement staircase if abandoned and there's no use of it. But once you step inside to follow the child's cry, you are doomed. The more you go down, the louder the cry gets. You never reach the end, and you never come out again. Prepare the crew members. They'll be going in now. I want to know what's at the end of that staircase, Chris said. Two crew members went inside the staircase wearing helmets. They were being tied to ropes so that the others could pull them out immediately if anything went wrong. Night vision cameras were fit onto the helmet to capture video recordings. 
they entered the basement, and the camera started recording. Go on. Keep going. What is that, sir? Chris looked at the camera closely. There was something in the dark, like a face. But before he could see it clearly, a huge scream of a child took place right near the camera. Both of the crew members screamed, and everything went dark. When they pulled out the ropes, they only found half the bodies of both of the crew members. It seemed half of their body was sliced by someone in there. The SCP Foundation is still trying to discover the mystery behind the staircase. They won't rest until they find it out. They have named it SCP-087, The Stairway. But Chris received the shock of his life after restoring the footage. Here, we are sharing the same footage with you. Take a look, if you dare. You're late, Daniel, Dr. Buchanan said. Daniel stood outside the lab with an awkward face. He just joined the Foundation as a trainee. It won't happen next time, Dr. Buchanan. Huh. It better not. Dr. Buchanan gave Daniel a warning stare and began his demonstration. Daniel on the second last table of the lab. Everyone was listening to Dr. Buchanan attentively, but Daniel was very distracted today. He looked outside the window. The deep woods and tall mountains make him feel too far from home. This secret foundation has chosen a real secluded spot for its research and experiments. People here are always living in high alert mode. One wrong step and death will be your end. This high profile yet secretive foundation has managed to contain evil in its actual mean. There were many more cases of violence and death caused by the creature residing in this very foundation. God knows what will happen if any of them sets free. No doubt, it was too much for Daniel to take in just one night. So far, he thought he was being part of a scientific research lab, but he never knew that he was unknowingly being a part of the most dangerous organization in the world, which people hardly knew about. I hope you started on your research paper, Daniel. I won't delay the deadline this time. Daniel looked at Dr. Buchanan and replied, Um, yeah, I'll submit on time this time. Among every people here, Dr. Buchanan is the most difficult one to impress. Daniel has a gut feeling that this man hates him. Daniel came out of the lab. Miranda was standing in the hallway, talking to some other colleagues. She almost rushed towards Daniel and said, Where were you? You were supposed to meet me in the morning. Daniel had completely forgot. Oh, I'm sorry, Miranda, I forgot. I'm a bit distracted since last night. Why? Is everything okay? Are you alright? Yeah, yeah, I'm fine. Just the pressure of work, I guess. Daniel said, giving a fake smile. Miranda guessed something was off with him today. She tried to cheer him up, saying, Come on, let's go to the cafeteria. I'm extremely hungry. Both of them started to walk towards the cafeteria. Daniel was walking quietly, while Miranda kept talking. Suddenly, Daniel said in a hesitant voice, Did you know this place holds lots of dark secrets? <laughs> Come on, Daniel. This is a scientific research facility. Science will always have its dark secrets. Daniel replied, No, that's not what I'm trying to say. You do know that this foundation has contained many dangerous specimens that can demolish humanity, right? Miranda looked around and said, Did you know that today a new specimen is going to arrive? I've heard it's so violent and dangerous. They'll be bringing it here during midnight. What kind of specimen? SCP-173. What kind of specimen is that? You'll find everything in the database. You do know how to hack it, right? Miranda laughed and walked into the cafeteria. Did she just tell me to hack the system? Daniel thought to himself. Everyone was busy having lunch. Daniel realized that this was the ideal time. 
He quickly walked towards the computer lab. There were only two people in the lab, and they were sitting at some distance. Daniel sat in front of a computer and started to hack the database. After 20 minutes, he managed to step inside the database. Everything this facility owns has a record in this database. Daniel searched SCP-173. A page opened with a bizarre image. SCP-173 looked like a huge sculpture, but with a distorted face. The first paragraph about this specimen read, Item, SCP-173 is to be kept in a locked container at all times. When personnel must enter SCP-173's container, no fewer than three may enter at any time, and the door is to be relocked behind them. At all times, two persons must maintain direct eye contact with SCP-173 until all personnel have vacated and relocked the container. An immediate question popped into Daniel's mind. What happens when eye contact has been broken with SCP-173? But the last paragraph answered his question immediately. It read, Line of sight must not be broken at any time with SCP-173. Personnel assigned to enter the container are instructed to alert one another before blinking. The object is reported to attack by snapping the neck at the base of the skull, or by strangulation. My god, what is this foundation up to? The entire day, Daniel kept thinking about SCP-173. He was terrified with his description, but at the same time, he was feeling curious as well. Two days went by, and Daniel kept roaming around the facility. He knew SCP-173 is here now. The tight security of the facility is signifying that only. Dr. Buchanan came to class late that day. Everyone was submitting their research paper just when Daniel noticed he had forgotten his file at home. He walked up to Dr. Buchanan and said, Hey, I forgot my file at home. Can I submit it tomorrow? <laughs> you think I'm stupid, Daniel. I told you I am not going to extend the deadline this time. But I'm not asking you to extend the deadline. I've already finished it, I just forgot it at home. I'll submit it tomorrow. But Dr. Buchanan didn't listen to Daniel's words. He struck some points from Daniel's performance chart and said, The more it will take you to submit the file, the more points you will lose, Daniel. Rules are rules. Daniel came out of the class with a furious face. Dr. Buchanan wanted to punish him for no reason. This guy is always looking for ways to make Daniel's life complicated. Anger brings vengeance, and this is what led Daniel to become someone that he is not. That evening, before leaving the facility... Daniel hacked the database one more time. He found out SCP-173 was kept in the second basement, and Dr. Buchanan is in charge of its containment. He came home, took a shower, and made his master plan. It's time to teach Buchanan a lesson. Around midnight, Daniel started from his house. He reached the facility and very carefully and silently snuck into basement two. He stood in front of the corridor and saw two security guards standing outside the containment cell of SCP-173. The security room stood on his left. Another guy was sitting in the room and watching SCP-173. Daniel tiptoed inside, and before the guy could turn around, he knocked him out. He noticed SCP-173 moving around the cell. The creature was standing near the door and secretly waiting for a single chance to get out and set free. He called Dr. Buchanan from the security room and said, Hurry up, doctor. You must come soon. SCP-173 is showing new signs in its behavior. The security has entered its cell and maintaining eye contact. You must hurry up now. And disconnected the call. Daniel then dressed in a lab coat and wore a protective mask to hide his face. He then walked to the security guard standing outside and said, You can all be released now. Dr. Buchanan will be here with his team. We're going to run some experiments on SCP-173. The guards looked at each other in suspicion. If you want, you can confirm by calling Dr. Buchanan yourself, Daniel said. One of the guards dialed Dr. Buchanan's number. Hello, Dr. Buchanan, are you coming? Dr. Buchanan replied in an excited tone. Yes, yes, I am almost near the facility. 
The guards then walked away, leaving Daniel in front of the containment cell alone. Daniel's plan worked out. All he had to do now was wait for Buchanan to arrive. After five minutes, Dr. Buchanan came rushing down the corridor. Where is everyone? He asked. Daniel replied in a serious voice. Everyone is waiting for you inside, Doctor. Would you like to go in? Dr. Buchanan replied. Okay, but how many people are keeping eye contact with SCP-173? Daniel replied. Three personnel are there already. You will be the fourth one to enter. Dr. Buchanan was so excited that he forgot to ask for ID proof or any detail of the man telling him all this. He had no idea what was waiting for him inside the door. Come on, doctor. Everyone is waiting for you inside, Daniel said in the same fake voice. Dr. Buchanan opened the containment cell with his key. It's a rule to lock the containment cell, even if there are people inside. Under no circumstances, these creatures can be left unlocked. Without a single doubt, Dr. Buchanan opened the door and quickly stepped in. Daniel didn't waste a single second as he saw the sculpture running at Dr. Buchanan in full speed. But you said, oh my god, where is everyone? Open the door, open! Dr. Buchanan didn't have to wait longer. He could scream only once, and then the sound of his neck being snapped took place. This door locks itself from the outside, so Daniel walked out of the facility in that disguise and slept peacefully that night. The next morning, the entire facility shook in fear. Dr. Buchanan's body was seen lying inside the containment cell through the CCTV camera. The guards reported that Dr. Buchanan came to do some experiments with his team, but it seemed like he came alone. People at the facility still can't figure out how Dr. Buchanan became so desperate to examine the SCP-173 that he entered its cell all by himself. People are calling him mad but the security guy is reported being knocked out by someone. But it seemed Dr. Buchanan entered the cell willingly. He unlocked the door and entered inside the cell. The key was in his pocket the entire time. Then what exactly happened to him? All right, that was three mysterious SCPs horror stories animated by IMR Entertainment. Now, while we were watching that terrifying episode this week and hanging out, I pulled out five cards for our annual dead spread. And this is what I got today. Or tonight, because it's nighttime, right? Well, daytime on other parts of the world. Let's not get into that. I'm deterring. I must be tired or something. <laughs> All right. Now, the person that, you know, who passed on was someone who, you know, was a possible Earth sign or had Earth in their chart. They were the type to always have the answers, someone who was able to help others in time of need. Now, looking back on their life, they wish they had paid more attention to their surroundings and the people around them. Possible air sign energy. A lesson they would like to share is stay patient in your endeavors. Everything will fall into place for you. Something they wish they had paid more attention to, their dreams and wish fulfillment. Instead of deviating from them, they felt like they didn't get enough time to accomplish them. Now a message they would like to share is, don't give up on what you want in life. Because working for yourself and enjoying life to the fullest will fulfill you or will fulfill your desires better. All right. All right. I love you all. Thank you so much for listening to me. My name is Libra Empress. Please don't forget to hit like, subscribe, and share. And I will see you for next week's Terror and Terror with me, Libra Empress. Stay safe. Love you. Bye.